Hi guys, thanks for joining me. This is part four, and in part four, we will be looking at the cracks that were supposedly created in member number 11 prior to the uh, stressing of the post tensioning bars uh, when the bridge collapsed. So the, the there was cracking that was identified by the the engineers when the bridge had been moved and set down they they identified cracks and they reported that those cracks were not critical to the owner and the state so the cracks were supposedly not critical and there was a presentation about the cracks two days before the collapse that the the engineers gave to the the owners and also there were state representatives there and we're going to try to figure out if if we could have uh, anticipated those cracks in the design so and we'll we'll review what to see whether the design was adequate for for the tension that that member saw during the move so before before we get into that i'd like to just thank you guys for joining me it's uh it's been a real pleasure getting all your feedback really great comments and a lot of just great insight and questions and it's just been it's you guys are killing it so I appreciate it and I'm trying to respond to, to everyone and I, I hope I, I have been if I if I haven't uh, just let me know but uh, I'm still trying to get used to all this uh, how this YouTube thing works and just uh, really appreciate you guys joining me for part four and uh, I I'm just really impressed it's it's been it's been a real pleasure hearing from all of you so and, and if and my, to my subscribers I think I have 15 now guys are awesome and i uh you know i'm i'm flattered really cuz uh it's uh you know it's just awesome so here we go uh, before we go into the actual analysis of the 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 diagonal and and look at the tension that was created during the move i just want to just go over quickly how the construction sequence occurred before the, just prior to the move so the bridge when it was being constructed was uh it's all it was all it was cast on site so the concrete that was used uh was delivered to the site and poured while the formwork was resting on false work so I'll just to clarify these terms false work is what is used to support a to support concrete formwork that is used to uh, to to support the concrete that is being poured so formwork is used to get the concrete into the shape into its final shape because concrete when it's poured is a liquid it's a it's like a thick liquid um, and it it needs to needs forms to keep it in in the shape that you want it to be in so these forms were resting on false work which are just towers these are temporary towers that are in, in uh, constructed Formwork sits on top of these false work towers, and then the concrete they, they construct the formwork into the member shapes that are specified. Uh, and the, the diagonals in the the bottom and the top canopy are are all formed with false work. The concrete's poured; it's allowed to cure. Curing of concrete is the process from when the concrete is is the process that takes place when the concrete is poured and it starts to harden so concrete when we specify concrete strengths uh, we are using a what's called a 28 day strength so 28 days is what we use as our baseline for what the concrete strength should be after that time period so in 28 days you'll you'll typical concrete mixes that you can pick up at like a home depot or 3000 or 4000 psi um, these are those are lower lower strength concrete than what was used here here they use an 8500 psi mix that's that 8500 or 3000 psi that you that you are hearing referred to that refers to the 28 day strength of that mix so the 8500 psi mix that was used here was poured and allowed to set up and cure a minimum of 28 days these are all this is standard construction methodology so I'm, I'm assuming 28 days is what was allocated for the curing of the concrete at a minimum all right so the concrete is allowed to cure 
and then the bridge now has some strength because the concrete has achieved its strength during the curing process it's got its 8500 psi supposedly and there, you know, they, they verify this in the field to make sure the concrete has reached its strength. There's, they take samples when the concrete is delivered to the site. They, they're, they're supposed to allow some of these samples to cure alongside in the field with the, 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 the concrete that's actually used in the bridge. They allow this, these samples of concrete to cure, and then they, t they send them out to a lab for testing to verify that the strength was achieved. So once the concrete strength is achieved, the uh, the SPMT towers that were used to, to transport the bridge to its final position are brought in. These SPMT towers, self-propelled modulating transporters, they they are installed by removing some of these false work towers. So a few of these false work towers are removed. The transporters are brought in to repl as their replacement and then the transporters actually can lift the bridge. They lift the bridge up off of the false work, and then the remaining false work towers can be removed as well. So false work portions are removed, transporters are brought in to replace those removed false work towers. The transporters then lift the bridge up off of the remaining false work so that the full weight of the bridge is now on these SPMTs, okay? So, in addition, I should mention that the, the post-tensioning that you hear, you hear a lot about in the news, the post-tensioning should have occurred prior to the transporters uh, being brought in. So these, these bars of steel that run the length of the members, and in this case you had bars These one and three quarter inch diameter bars in the diagonal truss members and and in specifically member number eleven were also uh, tensioned to the specified force uh, that's provided in this table. So member number eleven prior to move should have been tensioned with with uh, these post tensioning bars. So the post tensioning bars are tensioned. And that tension induces a compression into the truss diagonal member. The, 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 the reason for applying this uh, compression into the member is to resist tension stresses that are created. In this case, tension was created when the bridge was being moved. Member number 11 goes into tension, and I'm going to show you specifically how that happens in this next sketch here. So this sketch is showing you the, the, the end of the span, one end of the span, and approximately where the transporters were located. So there were two transporters on each end, and there were another two on, off the page here, not shown. So these two transporters are supporting the bridge, and this from this point to the end of the span, is a large cantilever. A large cantilever is basically this behaves like a like a diving board really. Um, this entire portion from the support out wants to deflect downwards. It wants to like a diving board when you're standing on the edge of a diving board and the diving board deflects downward. <clears throat> that's what that's what's wanting to happen here. Alright so that's the behavior that downward bending that downward deflection is introduces a tension force into member number eleven. All right. Now, as as previously discussed in my parts two and or specifically in part three, these truss members here and this vertical here are not really part of the truss system. They are they don't add to the strength of the truss. This is really just a beam, and this is just a column. So. You can really take them out of the truss behavior when you're analyzing the the actual truss. They are applying, they are adding to the weight at at this point here, but they're not really part of the of the truss system. All right, so so what we need to do then, I'm going to do quick quick calcs here, guys. So stay with me. 
Um, I know numbers aren't always interesting, but this is all this is all just to to verify and to see if the design was accurate. Um, I know there's a lot of theories that are being put out, and uh, really, if you're if you're doing engineering work and you're going to put out theories, you need to show some sort of math behind it, because um, that's what we do. Uh, th all these drawings that engineers put out all this that was done i mean th these drawings the there's a lot of calculations that's that are involved which are not you're not seeing them on the drawings so if i'm if i want to put out if i'm doing an analysis of of this and trying to show what may have happened and and put out a theory then that the calcs are, are critical here so again these are really basic calcs not, nothing fancy they are rough I mean they're they're approximate they're not uh, they're not to the nearest quarter of an inch my dimensions and the forces aren't to the nearest uh, half pound all right so they're approximate I uh, just understand these are these are just this is really just to give us an order of magnitude to understand if the design was was way off or or just to get a sense of what may have happened all right so so what we need to do is we need to figure out how much of the bridge weight is being applied at this end here okay so it's a very basic very basic equation so could be we know that the total weight of the bridge was 950 tons and we're going to assume that this 950 tons is uniformly applied from across the span of the bridge so 950 tons over 175 feet is what we're going to try to be figuring out, is what we're going to figure out. So 950 tons is total load, and we know that the span was 175 feet, okay? So assuming that the bridge was approximately equally weighed across its span gives us approximately 5.4 tons per foot of bridge length which is equivalent to 11 kips per foot that's 11,000 pounds per foot that's the equivalent kips per foot okay so we have 11 kips per foot so the way I'll illustrate that is with a a uniform load like that and that's going all the way across so 11 kips per foot you know everything's done on computers now so my my sketches are terrible and so forgive me I'm just it's just not the way it used to be with the, the sketches um, by hand at least so so this this uniform load I'm going to represent it along the bottom here is 11 kips per foot that's how we represent a uniform load. 11 kips per foot is the weight of the bridge uniformly applied. Okay, so 11 kips per foot. So we know we need to figure out how much is at this point here. So we're going to say that 11 kips per foot from from half from the mid midway point between the support and the end is being is going to this point here. So we're saying that the SPMT was approximately this outermost SPMT was approximately 32 feet from the end of the span so we're we're going to say that half of the 32 feet of that self weight goes to this point here so this is 16 feet distance here okay so 11 kips per foot times 16 feet is 176 kips so 176 kips is the self weight of the bridge at this point when you have the bridge being moved alright well, let's call it 
180 kips for round numbers. Alright, what's a few kips between friends? So, 180 kips of downward force here creates a tension force in member number 11. It creates an axial tension force in number 11. Axial tension force is is going to be, to be represented like that. All right. So that sketch is getting getting busy. So let me let me re redraw that very quickly here. Okay. So we have 180 kips down here. We have our support here. And we have our member number 11 in tension here. And we know this angle here is 37 degrees based on previous our previous part three, but and also based on these dimensions here. So so 37 degrees is our angle of member number 11. We have a 180 kip downward force from this cantilever. 100, so the equation is very basic. The force in number, member number 11, you sh this should look familiar to you if you watched my previous parts 3, 2, and 1, and times, so the member force in number 11 times the sine of 37. Uh, sine of 37 gives you the vertical component of the force in member number 11. That should equal 180 kips. Okay, so then if we, we bring everything over to, to solve for the force of member number 11, force of member number 11 is 180 kips divided by sine 37. And that equals approximately 300 kips. Okay, so that means that this force in member number 11 is 300 kips. Okay, that's great. So we know that the force in member number 11 is 300 kips. Now we need to compare that to how much compression was being applied by the post-tensioning bars. So we know from the table, and we're assuming here, of course, a lot of this is assumption. These drawings are... These, these are dated from 2015, so these are you know, they're almost three years old. Uh, the bridge was construction started about six months ago or so, so or maybe even more, um, seven or eight months. So these drawings changed, um, but we're going to say that based on what's showing here, and again, this is, should look familiar, 200 kips per bar and member number two, Member number 11 did not have a force showing for post-tensioning, but member 2 is the matching member on the opposite end of the bridge. We're going to say 200 kips was the, per bar, was the post-tensioning. So 200 kips, this is the cross-section of the member. 200 kips, 2 bars, would represent 2 bars. Really simple, guys. This isn't rocket science. 2 bars times 200 kips per bar equals 400 kips. All right, so 400 kips is the compression being applied by the post-tensioning bars. We have a 300 kip tension force from the SPMT movement, the overhang, the cantilever. That's good. Again, we it appears that we're good. We have squeezing of 400 kips. We have a force 300 that's trying to overcome that squeezing that's 300 kips of tension so we have plenty of squeeze happening here we have 400 kips of squeeze we have 300 kips trying to overcome the squeeze so we should still have if these two cancel each other out you should still have 100 kips of squeeze after you cancel if after you take subtract 300 from 400 you have 100 kips of excess squeeze so that member is not in tension so then member number 11 is not in tension during the move so now the question begs 
why were there cracks developed in that member? Because that member, while it is seeing a tension force, the member is not experiencing any tensile stresses. So I hope that makes sense. So this, the cracking, why did it occur? Did it occur in member number 11? If it did occur in member number 11, why? Why was it there? And the only possible explanation would be that there was either more uh, downward force from self-weight at this point or that the post-tensioning bars were once again not properly stressed or uh, just a flaw in a design that that we're just not seeing in this analysis and and you know it's this it looks like it should work it looks like you shouldn't have cracks uh, it looks like and again and and the other end it doesn't appear that there were cracks on the other end and the other end had a similar type configuration during the move so the other end the member in this in the other end was number two did not appear to have cracks in on that end so why member number 11 had cracks and member number two on the opposite end did not is is another question that, that will need to be resolved and and i don't have the answer for that either so uh, we're just speculating as to why those cracks occurred and and i'm i, I guess i'm speculating really and i i don't i don't have an answer for that one so so that's that's where we are um My guess is that the cracks may have occurred at, they may have been noticed at this point right here. Uh, and the reason I say that is, like I previously mentioned, uh, you have, at this panel point, I, I'm not sure any cracks were, I'm, I'm doubting that cracks were noted here. Um, I'm I'm thinking that some of those cracks may have been identified at this panel point location. And and the reason I say that is because you have at that at that point there you have a bunch of post tensioning and in addition to other and I think there's also pre tension I think post tensioning primarily, but post tensioning bars that are coming together. So you have bars from this slab here and this member here that are coming together. And, and I'll look at this that detail here. This shows a bunch of bars going together. And this, this is what it would look like down here. It'd be something similar. Um, so that that is, this area here is, is what needs to be examined further as well as to, as well as what we've done, which is just look at the member. But this connection here is, you have a lot of forces, a lot of stress is happening here. You have a stress from this bar being tensioned and this bar and this bar and this bar, and they're all kind of overlapping. And that, that, that can become a hairy situation because you have a lot of this, this is a comp, this is, becomes pretty complicated. And, and to model this and to accurately analyze this can be, it's pretty complicated and, and I don't because the bridge was so unique in its design and and definitely a little bit I would say it was innovative just because you don't see this uh, this type of of, of a truss system um, that that would be my a point where I would focus my my attention and and I'm sure the investigators are and they're looking at all the the possibilities but uh, so ba based on what based on what I've come to in my conclusion in the, the numbers is that the the post tensioning should have been adequate to resist tension during the move and and that post tensioning should not have resulted in cracks in the member and and the only possible explanation would be that there were some uh, there was either inadequate tensioning or some other some other construction oversight that that may have happened and and I, anything else is just speculation because I I mean a lot of this is speculation but I, I don't really have an explanation for why those cracks would have occurred based on the numbers here so hope you guys have found that interesting hope you're learning something if if this is new to you 
uh, at least you can see the process that an engineer goes through in his, in his design. I know there's been a lot of questioning of the engineering capabilities of the team that put out this bridge design and and I'm I'm involved on the engineering side so I'm kind of partial to the amount of and I know how much effort goes into putting uh and and thought goes into these these uh designs and so I'm I'm not as quick to say that I, I hesitate to just say that the engineer screwed up because I've I've been I mean I've had the finger pointed at me so I know how easy that is to to have people for people to do so I don't know I hope you guys consider consider the possibility that the en the engineer may not have screwed up and maybe maybe he did maybe this is I'm I'm not taking him off the hook here because you know these guys they get paid you know they get paid to to, to get this right but um it's tough to say what exactly happened and the finger pointing is something that I'm you know, I, I'm not gonna do, and and I'm just gonna try to to see if if there's if if the design could have been at a flawed and and maybe maybe it was maybe maybe there's something we're just not seeing in these post tensioning bars that happen in the field, or may, maybe the it was just not properly designed. Maybe the detail just failed. So a lot of questions, guys. I'll I'll try to keep you posted. Again, thanks for the views. Thanks for the comments. You guys rock, and and I will, I will respond to you uh, as your comments come in. So again, appreciate your appreciate watching, and uh, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Bye.